Hello and welcome to the Alliance for Democracies, the Populist Dialogues. I'm your host, David Delk. Today our guest is Gina Ronning. She is a board member, a program developer, and a facilitator of the Insight Development Group and also a member of the Pacific Green Party. So welcome to the show, Gina. Thank you very much for having me, David. Yeah. So the first question, obviously, is what is the Insight Development Group? Well, the Insight Development Group uh, could be articulated in terms of a restorative justice dialogue program that is volunteer-based, um, nonprofit that operates uh, currently within the Oregon State Correctional Institute, but we're not part of the prison system. We are an outside organization made up of a variety of different volunteers from different backgrounds. And um, it is a program where basically we facilitate restorative conversations with inmates to help them build the skills and tools necessary to address issues of harms, accountability, healing, and nonviolent communication and healthy relationships along with conflict resolution processes that create a, um, a healthy process for social reintegration. Okay, all right. Well, my next question was going to be, what is restorative ju justice? So you kind of went into that. Just a little more detail, focus specifically on what is restorative justice. Sure. Restorative justice, uh, in general, is really hard to articulate in one unified definition. Um, people, um, whether they be scholars or practitioners across the board, don't um, have an agreed upon definition of what it is. But I would say that based on the work that I do, restorative justice is a process for making right the harms that happen among people and in relationships. And the idea behind restorative justice is that it's the currency upon which we decide makes the right balance. When um, when an imbalance occurs, when, when um, a moral harm occurs, a physical harm, an emotional harm, and it's looking at processes that right the social balance. Um, it's not just about fixing relationships between a uh, victim and offender, it's about fi fixing the relationships within the whole society. Um, it acknowledges this idea that when a harm occurs on any level, it creates a ripple effect, and that people are deeply impacted on a variety of different levels. And that, therefore, healing, um, that the role of justice is to create healing and so that the society and individuals involved in a conflict can move forward in a healthy way and in a sustainable way as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. So this works within the current system of punitive justice, criminal well, justice. Yeah. Um, so there's different arguments about how restorative justice can play out, and there's many different levels of restorative processes. The work that I do specifically on a spectrum um, would be considered partially restorative or mostly restorative, and a lot of that has to do with the amount of stakeholders that are involved. The punitive system, as we currently have it, has uh, legal restrictions. Um, that prevent full restorative processes from taking place. And a lot of it has to do with victims' rights, victims' advocacy, but as well as some of the values that guide retributive policies um, inherently block restorative processes. And so we can operate currently within the system, uh, but it is, it, it's an upward hill battle because a lot of the things that are currently in place uh, contradict and do not reconcile with a lot of the values that we're trying to instill um, in our communities and in our in our justice system. Okay. So it doesn't sound like you would suggest that we should replace the current system with restorative justice, but that the current rules that you have to operate under need to be adjusted so that your type of program would be more effective? Right. I think the number one criticism of restorative justice uh, philosophy and practice is that it's too utopian or ideal. Mm -hmm. But anyone actually engaging in the work of restorative practice knows that there are realities in our world and our community um, that it's not black or white. It's not replace the system with another one. It's about moving forward. And so the idea is, is that um, it's about the way we handle conflict. And so restorative justice attempts to broaden our understanding of the different tools available to us as individuals and as communities of ways of dealing with conflict in a, in a healthier and nonviolent manner. And so there's a lot uh, to be learned from that. And it's not to say that everything in our current justice system is negative um, in regards to if we look at prisons in particular and this idea of separating people from their communities, it's not to say that every situation um, doesn't call for that. Um, but it's the idea that we need to stop looking at crime, you know, in the sense that it's coming in through a vacuum. You know, there are deep histories and contexts that surround criminal behavior, and we need to look at that 
more deeply, and that's basically what it calls us to do. Yeah, it doesn't really call us to do that, though, uh, or, or maybe I'm wrong. It doesn't seem like it really calls for us to look at the roots um, at a system level, but at the roots of, of the individual that committed the crime? It's both. Uh, it's very holistic in nature. It's this idea that we're looking at individuals um, and their history and their life and their emotions and we're looking at the history of collective communities as well and we're looking at the systemic policies and history of a correctional system uh, that perpetuates violence and so the idea is if we are going to intervene in systems of violence uh, we have to look at the origins of that and where that comes from because that is how only first when we understand that history can we attempt to s sort of change it and reform it. Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah, yeah. It, it would appear to me that because I know you work with the Pacific Green Party, and knowing a little bit about them, I would think that they would be more focused on the structural, systemic uh, origins of criminal behavior. Uh, so uh, I, I assume that because you're working with them that that would be part of, of what you're after as well. Absolutely. My work with the Pacific Green Party, I was asked to join on as a board member, was because of my passion and interest for justice reform. And the Pacific Green Party has several pillars on its platform um, to look at a sustainable and healthy future. Um, and justice and justice reform are definitely one of them. And so I'm sort of the advocate and um, developer for that aspect of the platform and so we're looking at structural changes and policy changes to help uh, promote restorative practice both um, on a systems level and on a community level and you know we're looking at a variety of different issues uh, from death penalty repeal to um, restorative sentencing and a variety of other factors. Okay, restorative sentences, sentencing, how, how does that, how, what would a restorative sentence be? Well, one of the main uh, concepts behind restorative justice is that the reason why it's not, our current system is not restorative is that the state becomes the primary voice in the justice process. When a crime occurs, the voice of the victims as well as the offender and the family becomes the state. And so the idea of restorative sentencing would be basically contextualizing criminal behavior so that victims and communities have a voice in the justice process. Uh, decisions are made um, on behalf of everyone on the state as if the state knows what's best. And the reality is unless you're actually talking with communities and individuals and victims as well as offenders, we don't know what's best. And so it's the idea of, um, you know, looking at, for example, uh, three strikes you're out policies, looking at uh, maximum uh, sentencing, minimum mandatory sentencing. These are all uh, elements of policy that remove voice from communities. And so um, we have to really look carefully at the policies that we're putting in to look at if it's really helping us produce the outcome in regards to safety, security, and sustainability in our communities that we want. Mm -hmm. Okay. And wh when you say communities, define communities. Sure. Um, I would articulate community as being those relationships that we're engaged with on an individual, personal, and intrapersonal level. So we're looking at where people live, uh, uh, their sense of place. We're looking at also how we are connected, right? Technology today, when we look at media, we look at pop culture. We look at how um, we're virtually connected with each other through technology. So community nowadays is a much broader scale. So I think we're really looking at uh, community from a very grassroots level to the broader community, you know, from neighborhoods to city, state, nation, and even country, you know, internationally speaking, uh, because we are all influenced by what we would call the narrative of justice that plays out in our social media, in our news, and pop culture. And so we're looking at how to give people a sense of that community to realize that they are part of a larger web of relationships, even if they don't feel directly connected with their sense of place, geographically speaking. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, uh, this uh, your your insight development group. Uh, I think that I read online that that was started or instigated by four inmates. Is yes. Absolutely. So one of the key elements of restorative processes is that it's a collaborative process. And so that what makes our 
our program unique um, is the idea that it is inmate initiated and their voice uh, is collaborative and they have a huge say if not a very large portion of the say on how the program develops because restorative justice another element to this is need-based processes so again giving people their own voice not speaking for them so this is why it's important to have the inmates themselves as well as victims victims families right be a part of the process and so the program uh, started a few years ago, about three years ago, four years ago, by four inmates um, discovering that there is a huge need that prison systems warehouse people. And the actual emotional aspects of getting people to a place of understanding why they did what they did is wrong doesn't exist mm -hmm. pr predominantly in our system. And so they identified a need and through their chaplain services put out a call for some sort of process that would help them actually heal and learn and understand why they're there and what got them there. And they had heard about other prison restorative processes happening across the nation and so they initiated this. And it's great because four years later we've been invited into three other institutions and this coming year we'll be starting a program in Mac McLaren Juvenile Facility as well as Oregon State Penitentiary. Oh, okay, so, so juvenile uh, detention um, facilities as well? Yes. Okay, great. How many programs are there like this across the nation that we've never heard of? <laughs> right. It's hard to know because yeah. so many of these programs are nonprofit grassroots. Um, and some of them, um, the difficulty is on a scientific level uh, in regards to getting uh, known on a systems level is that we are doing a lot of what we would call qualitative research. Uh, which currently in the current justice system, evidence-based practice makes it really difficult for restorative processes to be taken seriously as an actual form of uh, justice intervention that could be widely accepted by the correctional culture. So in regards to how many programs there are, it's hard to say. Um, a lot of them actually don't necessarily want a lot of attention for fear that they might become programmatized, let's say, mm -hmm. by the correctional facilities. Uh, but it's growing and the concept of restorative processes are no longer necessarily a high in the sky ideal uh, but the current system isn't working and so even the systems that are currently in place are really looking at alternatives and we're getting it it's an opportune time I think in this country in this moment to um, sharing this message and this vision of a new way forward in dealing with crime. Do you have any statistics with regard to prisoners who have gone through this process as in terms of going back to prison, recommitting crimes? Right, so that's a really great question. Um, I know that currently that is some of the studies here in the U.S. are needing, uh, we need more quantitative research based on that. I can tell you, um, based on my own focus of study, that on an international level when we look at Canada, New Zealand, Australia, and Norway, or the Scandinavian and other countries, that there are quantitative studies being done. And the recidivism rate in a particular case study would be Bestoy Prison, which is a restorative ecological uh, correctional facility um, in Norway. And their recidivism rate is something like 18%, which is uh, based on my interview uh, with the director there was something like 30 to 40 percent less than all of the institutions in Europe and it's it's a great thing and they're tracking recidivism in general is tracked between two to three years after the release of individuals so we would need to definitely start tracking that um, our program is so new that there's a lot of things that we need to get into place before we can actually conduct that formal type of research um, a lot of it has to do with ethical reviews and making sure that our um, our program is in a place where we can safely do that because we're working with a very vulnerable population. Right, yeah. So you mentioned about going to Norway and visiting Norway in this particular, in Norway, is there just one particular prison that has this kind of program or, or is the whole prison operated on these bases or principles or? Norway definitely has traditional prisons that we would consider traditional in the way we think of them he that we have here in the U.S. But in general, Norway is a lot more progressive in its correctional thinking. Um, and Bestoy Prison uh, is a, I don't even want to call it a prison because it's its not. It's a, it's, I, would, I would call it a rehabilitation intervention program that allows inmates to um, engage with their communities and actually work on themselves, which is not something that a traditional prison does. Uh, Bestoy is amazing, um, and one of, the, one of the things that I definitely gained from visiting uh, is this idea that we need to also, besides working on restorative processes, 
it's this idea that we need to connect people with their ecological environments around them and that working in those environments directly uh, fosters a sense of relationship with a greater whole, which is part of self-transformation. And it's a really key element in, in rehabilitating offenders. Well, yeah, yeah I, I sense a totally different approach to criminal justice here than I've ever heard. I, uh, one of the things that strikes me is we have been talking about the inmates primarily. Uh, how do the victims factor in? Right, so the restorative justice in this country uh, was greatly launched by victims' needs um, and victims' voice campaigns. That The idea was that our current system does not allow victims to have a say in the process. Everything from uh, trial to sentencing to release. And the reality of it is, is that um, there are programs that involve victims. You know, victim offender mediation is one of them, and our program actually works closely with that. Many of our members that are currently facilitators are also members of uh, the victim offender mediation program where they facilitate face-to-face -face meetings with offenders and victims. The reality is because of state law, creating restorative processes where offenders and victims get to meet face to face is very difficult. Offenders cannot at this time initiate a conversation with their victims and surprisingly, uh, despite what most people might think, many offenders, if not most, want to actually have this face to face meeting, but they're not allowed to by law. Victims have to initiate. And right now, the correctional system does not really inform victims even, even though that these programs exist, they don't inform them that they're an option. So the goal of restorative process, in an ideal sense, if our program could expand to where we're getting victims involved directly, the idea is, is that they are able to share how harm and the crimes that they were victims of uh, impacted them, their lives and their families and their communities. And the idea is to create a broader sense of understanding uh, because the reality is when people commit harms, uh, their sense and their lens of the world often doesn't involve other people. And it's this idea that we live in constant relationship and we need to be looking at relationship as a means for rehabilitation. Okay. And does that answer your question? Yeah, yes, I think so, right, yeah. Um, the structure of the prison in Norway, is it different than typical prison here in the United States? Well, for one, yes, because they're not locked up in cells. Uh, this is Bestoy Prison specifically. They are on an island um, about two hours outside of Oslo, and they live on a farm island. It's a, basically a farming community. They have a school. They have a, a church. They have a library. They have a health and medical center. And uh, there's only, <laughs> I want to say, about 12 security officers there on the island at any given time. They're not armed. Uh, the inmates are free to roam around the island. They work the island. They run the island. The island is an ecological facility, meaning that it runs basically off-grid. They grow their own food. They take care of animals and livestock, forestry management. Uh, Norway is big in maritime and fishing. Uh, they actually run the ferry. The inmates run the ferry that go from Bestoy Island to Horten, which is the town right across the way. And the food they grow, for example, goes into the community of Horten. Um, one of the main differences of Bastoy Prison um, also is that it's basically a community-run institution in the sense that uh, it's not state-controlled the way that everything here is state-controlled. Uh, the schools that they have aren't run by the state, it's run by the schools of the community. The hospital's run by the local nurses. So the relationships, it isn't that they're just locking these people away and we don't see or hear from them anymore. The idea is that there's a, there are obligations that have been created from harms, and you actually need to be even more involved in your community now for reparations, restitution. And so they, they look at that as a way of um, building a sense of uh, healing, not only for the men there, but for the community as well, because it, um, often the way our current prison structure works is it actually creates more fear in our communities. We, are, mm -hmm. we have big, giant, scary warehouses filled with monsters and we don't want to see or hear of them and they just need to be kept locked away. But the reality is many of these people are human beings um, and actually, they've done- Actually they're all human beings. And they're all human right, beings, yeah. but I mean, but what I mean is, <laughs> yes. is that despite their crimes is that we need to look at people not just for their crimes, that there is a huge story behind it. Mm -hmm. And they've done some horrible things, I mean, granted. Um, and maybe some of them maybe shouldn't ever be out depending on what's going on with them. But 
um, nonetheless, there are still needs in our community that we could be meeting um, in a much better way than we're currently doing. Yeah. And so do, do you have any idea how the inmates of this particular prison are chosen? That's a great question, and that was definitely one of the questions that I had, as well as the men that I worked with here at OSCI. I talked to them about my trip, and I, um, that was one of their questions they wanted me to ask. And so uh, how it works over there is um, it's, not, it's not a facility that's open to anyone and everyone, right? We have to be practical because people have to be in their own emotional and mental space that are really willing to accept this level of responsibility. So there's an open call out for inmates throughout Norway. They have to write an essay to basically ask, you know, or tell the institution why they think they're a good fit there, why they want to be there, what they think they're going to gain from it. So that in relationship with their own personal history, their record of violence, and their behavior within the institutional system is looked at, the type of crime, um, and sort of their mental readiness to be in an environment like that is sort of examined, and then they're screened through those security measures, and then they're allowed to come. The first, I believe, six to eight weeks uh, when they're there is actually a trial, like probationary period, where they kind of get to see if they're a good fit. Um, and if they are, they get to stay and basically carry out the rest of their sentence on the island before they are released. And it's a great, what we would call, um, intermediary program because a lot of these men, uh, especially in Norway, they, uh, they don't have life sentences. 21 years is tops for any crime. So all people there will be getting out. And so this is a great program for people um, to learn how to reintegrate back into their communities. And, and so the island um, gives them that chance. You talked earlier about ecological justice and within the context of this larger program. Just define that a little bit more for us. What, what is ecological justice? Well, for me, I think, again, with concepts like this, depending on your background and philosophy and what you believe, we, we're going to have varied ideas of what this means. But for the work that I do and what I've witnessed, it's this idea that, and, and in some ways, I feel like we're going back towards sort of an indigenous way of looking at human relationships. But it's this idea that it's not just that we're in relationship with each other as human beings, but that we are in relationship with our environments and the system of creation as a whole. And that if we, <laughs> we treat each other the way sort of we look at the world around us, if we have no regard and don't believe that we're interconnected on sort of this universal level, if you will, why would we care about our brothers and sisters um, that we live among right now. And it's this idea of creating a sense of, dare I say, even love and mutual respect for life in general uh, in order to actually help foster healthy relationships. And so ecological justice is the sense of looking at right relationships with our environments as well as our fellow species. Um, because living in a relationship isn't just about, oh, our neighbors or the people I go to school with or the people I work with. It's how we live every day. Um, as we destroy our environments, the greater risk we have of creating conflict in a way that actually degrades relationships. And so it's about understanding this, what many indigenous cultures would regard as the interconnectedness principle, mm -hmm. and that we can no longer compartmentalize social issues, that they are all interrelated, and we need to understand and examine how they're interrelated as a means for creating resolution processes that actually deal with all of the components instead of each individual one. Okay, excellent, good. You brought a little book with you. Uh, tell us about the book. Yes, I brought, uh, it's a book by Howard Zare, and it's called The Little Book of Restorative Justice. And I recommend this book for anyone who is interested in getting a basic overview of what restorative justice is, the principles behind it. Um, Howard Zare is a leader in the field. Uh, and he articulates the concepts very well, and he gives a very practical understanding. And a very, it's not very long. Um, in fact, it's only like 80 pages. Um, really, you could read it in a half a day. And it just gives people um, insight to what it's about and how you can um, incorporate these principles, not only in a prison setting, but in everyday life. Uh, restorative justice is about creating restoration in relationships um, everywhere. And it's a great launching pad for those that might be interested in not only educating others about it, but getting more involved. Great. Okay, good. Thank you very much for being here, Gina. Thank you very much. Okay, good. So we've been talking with Gina Ronning, who is uh, a facilitator and board member at the Inter Insight Development Group and a member of the Pacific Green Party uh, about restorative justice. And uh, so I want to talk about uh, something which is coming up here in Portland. Uh, unfortunately, 
Unfortunately, the first week of October marks yet another year of war in Afghanistan. It also marks the one-year start of Occupy Portland. Uh, therefore, here in Portland, we're going to gather to protest the war and also to celebrate Occupy Portland with a two-day event. Saturday, October 6th, gather at Shemansky Park in Portland's downtown for a rally and march. That is at the South Park blocks at Southwest Salmon Street. The rally in March starts at 12 noon. The next day, sun Sunday, October 7th, attend and participate in the teach-in at Portland Community College Cascade Campus located at North Albina and Killingsworth. The teach-in will run again from 12 noon until 5 p.m. The focus on all of this is end the wars and occupations, no nukes, no drones, money for jobs, education, health care, housing and the environment, not war, Main Street, not Wall Street, power to the people, and restore constitutional rights. So that, again, that's October 6th for the March and Rally uh, and the teaching on October 7th. Never miss an episode of Populist Dialogues again. Populist Dialogues is now available on YouTube. Go to youtube.com, search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows this year and to subscribe to the series. We're also available on Blip TV. Search for Populist Dialogues. Mission of the Alliance for Democracy is to end corporate domination, establish true democracy, and create a just society based on a sustainable, equitable economy. Learn more? Visit our national website at www.thealliancefordemocracy.org or our Portland website at www.afd-pdx.org. Thanks to the crew today for being here and getting us on the air. Roger Bates, Joan Horton, Ethan Scarrow, Janet Morris, and Tom Thomas. And thanks to you, the audience, for watching. We'll see you again next week. Bye. Corporations are people. Money is speech. The U.S. Supreme Court for more than the past century has ruled that corporations have constitutional rights as if they were flesh and blood people like you and I and since 1976 have repeatedly ruled that for political purposes money is speech. In January of 2010 they ruled in Citizens United versus the FEC that corporations can spend corporate funds directly on so-called independent campaigns and the floodgates were opened. We want our democracy back. We can take our democracy back from the plutocrats and the corporations by amending the U.S. Constitution to make clear that corporations are not people and that money is not speech. Join us now in this new democracy movement and support amending the Constitution. Learn more at movetomend.org or here in Portland, Oregon at movetomendpdx.org. And join the democracy movement with the Alliance for Democracy in Portland, afd-pdx.org, and nationally at thealliancefordemocracy.org. All right, let's get this done.